don't be afraid Run into wide open spaces Grace is waiting for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom There is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is song just fired me up. I'm happy to be here. Good morning. Welcome to Bethany First Church. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here. We're very excited that you've joined us uh, for church this morning. Hey, if it's your first time, if you have a prayer request, anything like that, we'd love to connect with you. Just uh, lift up that armrest, fill out that connect card. Uh, we'd love to bring you into this community, let you know about events going on, stuff like that. We'd love to connect with you, so just drop that off at the Welcome Center. Uh, one event coming this Friday. Uh, the Newsboys are coming here to town, uh, here to BFC. It's awesome, gonna be a lot of fun. They're no BFC worship band, but they are pretty good, okay? That's gonna be 7 p.m. Uh, this Friday. You can buy your tickets online for that. 
We also have Trunk or Treat coming up. That's October 31st, 6 to 8 p.m. at the FLC parking lot. It's going to be a great time for families. Uh, bring your kids. We also think it's going to be a great opportunity uh, for us to reach out to the community. So if you'd like to help out with that, bring your card, decorate a trunk, uh, uh, give candy, anything like that, you can sign up online uh, to help with that. Uh, thank you for, for being generous people. Y'all are generous with your time. You're generous with your resources. Uh, thank you for all the ways that you give. Know that you're giving truly is making a difference in people's lives. You can give online in the app or you can drop by for tithes and offerings in the boxes in the back, labeled Give and Connect. Well, hey, the last uh, few few weeks, we've been in a series called The Fight. Uh, we've been reminded uh, uh, that there are things worth fighting for and that God is fighting with us and that God is fighting for us. Uh, but today we're gonna hear from the one and only Dr. David Busick. He's gonna speak on the rich young ruler. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, but before we keep singing, uh, let's pray. Dear God, I'm grateful to be here at church this morning. I'm thankful for BFC. God, thank you for uh, the life that you've given us, the freedom that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ, uh, the grace that we, we've, we've received. God, we're, we're grateful for it this morning. Uh, God, would you help us leave here today uh, looking just a little more like you. We love you, God. Amen.
you bow your heads and just let me pray for you, okay? Father, th- there is nothing that is better than you. 
There's nothing in our lives that even begin to compare to you. And to be in your house this morning and to be in your presence and to be able to worship you with this community of believers, we are so grateful. We want to meet you here, Lord. With, with, with your heads bowed and your eyes just closed for a moment, could we just pray a simple prayer together this morning that says this, God, my heart is open. My mind is open. My ears are open to what you want to say to me today. I'm open to what you want to do in me today. I'm just saying, Lord, I'm here. I want you to speak to me. I don't want to leave the same way that I was when I came. God, do something in my heart today. Speak to me. Touch me. Change me. And all of God's people together said, amen. Hey, I've got the uh, Schellenberger family with me this morning. And uh, this is Matt and Madison. And uh, Camden Grace is here with us also. And you got lots of family with you today. It's great to see everybody. Yeah. Um, so you have a verse this morning, Matt, that you want to read for Camden's life verse. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. That's my prayer, too. That's a great verse for Camden. You know, Matt and Madison, as you come, you not only this morning simply state your faith in Jesus and your desire to live your lives to honor him, but you also come saying that this is what we desire for Camden. We want her to know and love the Lord with all of her life. Isn't she a precious gift? Aren't you just blessed beyond measure to have her? And so you also make a statement that we will do everything in our power to guide her eyes to God's word, that we will guide her feet to the sanctuary and her heart away from anything that would displease God in any way. If this is truly what you're saying today, will you say we will? And so as a congregation and as lots of family this morning joining us, they make a statement today saying that they're going to do everything in their power to help raise Camden to know and to love Jesus. And so will you also say we will in agreement that you will join them in this effort? Amen. So Camden's grandpa is here today. And uh, it's Dr. David Busick, and he's going to dedicate Camden to the Lord this morning. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, our hearts are so full of joy because of the gift of Camden Grace. You have blessed the Schellenberger and the Busick family in so many ways. And Camden is just another evidence of your grace. And as Pastor has already said, we commit her to you. We believe that you have great plans for her life. We are committed from our part to do everything that you're calling us to do, to be witnesses of your grace. So now, Lord, we bring Camden Grace to you. We dedicate her in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We give you God praise and thanks for Camden Grace Shelter. Um, reminding you of this day and a copy of God's word that we pray be a guide for her life. You want to show her off a little bit? I don't think people really got to see her you know, well. Can we you got know? another pop. We, we got do a have another pop right over here. here. That's right. Yeah. Like, would you walk with me, Papa? All right. Let's just walk over here. <laughs> Camden Grace Schellenberger. <laughs> Camden Grace Schellenberger. She looks like Matt with a hair bow. Camden Grace Schellenberger. Thanks be to God. 
Let's, let's celebrate with the Schellenbergers today, shall we? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, today is a, a special day for us, and I'm very excited that Dr. David Busick is with us for Camden's dedication, <clears throat> and I've also asked him if he would preach for us this morning. So let me talk to you a little bit this morning about Dr. David Busick. Uh, he is on my daily prayer list. And the reason that I pray for Dr. Busick daily, many reasons. One is that he carries a great weight on his shoulders. David uh, serves as a general superintendent in the Church of the Nazarene. Now, there's a board of six general superintendents, and you may say, what do those six people do? So here's what they do. They oversee the work of the Church of the Nazarene around the world. So, so in a moment, David is going to come, and that man who stands here is charged with the duties of overseeing the work of the Church of the Nazarene worldwide. That's 164 countries. That's 2.6 million Nazarenes around the world. He, he literally travels the world to do his job. So tomorrow, he and his wife, Christy, who are here, uh, they will jump on an airplane and they will travel to seven different countries over the next three weeks. It's a very busy life that they live. So they need all of our prayers, don't they? So I pray for David daily, that God will protect him, that God will bless him, and that God will use him powerfully. He's also the husband of Christy, and he has three wonderful kids um, who are adults now and have kids. Um, I'm sorry. Megan, and then uh, Ben, and I'm just dying for Madison's name, but I finally got it. Madison, who was just standing beside me a moment ago. He has seven grandkids. Um, I would love to say this about David as well before he comes. He is also a great friend. Uh, we communicate weekly, um, sometimes many times through the week. He is a blessing in my life. And I have great confidence in the future of the church with men like David Music leading it. And I know you're anxious to do this, so let me let you do this now. Would you please welcome Dr. David Music as he comes to bring the Word of God to us this morning. Well, good morning, church. It kind of looked like there was another song coming, so I wanted to be careful there. It's a privilege to be here in my home church, the church that I love so much. And you know that this is Pastor Appreciation Month for our church. Uh, and I've been watching that on Facebook. All of our pastors are being appreciated. And I think it would uh, be appropriate for me to say an official thank you to my pastor. Pastor Rick is my pastor. And uh, I love so many things about him. I love his heart for God. I love his heart for the mission of the church. Uh, I, love, I love the way he shepherds the flock. But his, his deep friendship with me, he's truly become one of my best friends. And as pastor, I want to say from our hearts, from the Busick family, how much we love and appreciate you. Now, I will say this. You know, when I was pastor here, uh, people would, were so, so generous with me. And one time, I... I'm not sure it was the mistake, but it was a comment that I made, and I told everybody that I like pecans. And the next Sunday, I had garbage bag full of pecans. And so let me tell you during pastor appreciation what Pastor Rick likes. He likes Pro V1 golf balls. So if you want to just pour it on, just shower him with Pro V1 golf balls, and show them your appreciation. Thanks, Pastor, for the, the invitation. So take your Bibles with me, if you will, please, and turn to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. That's the first book in the New Testament. We're going to look at chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19. And as we get ready to read this together, let me remind you that in the Church of the Nazarene that he described, we have a mission statement. It is to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. 
So that's our whole mission as a church is to make holiness disciples, people who look like Jesus, Christ-like people. Our core values are three things. We, we are uh, Christian, we are missional, and we are holiness. So the question of this morning is, what does it mean to be a holy person? What does holiness look like when you see it? And what does it mean to be wholly given over to God? That's what I think this passage is telling us this morning. Matthew chapter 19. Will you stand with me, please, as we honor the reading of God's Word? It'll also be on the screens. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, well, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we all say together, thanks be to God. Gracious God, thank you for your presence that's close with us here. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The context of this passage is very clear. Jesus was teaching a crowd of people about a theme that was very common to his preaching ministry. He was teaching them about the kingdom of God. And after his teaching had been completed, there was a young man who stepped forward and asked Jesus a question. He said, teacher, that's what they often called him, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? What are the requirements, Jesus? What are the commitments? What are the conditions that I have to meet in order to have life forever? I think it was an honest question. I think it was a sincere question. I mean, who doesn't want to have the answer to a question like that? Who in this room doesn't want to know the question, how can I have life forever? Now, before I tell you what Jesus' answer was in this case, I need to give you a few things that we know from this text about the young man who asked the question. The first thing we know for sure is that he was a young man. And I don't know for sure how old he was, but... Since Jesus' original 12 disciples, scholars tell us, were probably in their early 20s, some people would even say that John, the writer to the Gospel of John, that he may have been 16 years old or so when Jesus first called him. Just assuming that, I'm going to say that this young man was in his early 20s. My grandson Jackson is here today. He's 23. Let's say he's Jackson's age. The second thing we know for sure about this young man is that he was a wealthy man. So there's only one thing better than being a, a young man. It's being a rich young man. It means that he didn't struggle. He, he had all of his material needs were being met. He, he wasn't struggling for money. So he was a young man. He was, he was a wealthy man. The third thing we learn, and this is a little harder to define, but we find that he was a ruler. He was a rich, young ruler, which is to say that, yes, he had some cash, but he was also successful. And we don't know how he was successful, but he was, it's, he was in charge of groups of people. Maybe he was a young entrepreneur. Maybe he was rising up the corporate ladder, but he had some influence. Maybe he was into politics. He could have been a mayor in his town. We're not quite sure everything, but we know that he was an influencer. He was a person of influence. So he was, he was a young man. He was a wealthy man. He was a ruler. And the fourth thing we know is that he was religious which means he kept the commandments. He was moral. He was ethical. He was, he was a respectable person. Bottom line, he was a really, really good guy. 
So here we have this young, wealthy, successful guy with a lot going for him who, by the way, knows a lot about religion, and he's just an all-around good person. And it got me to thinking, that sounds a little bit like all of you here today. Some of you here today, a lot of you here today are young. And the reason I know that is you can, you can kind of figure out if you're young by, these, by answering these questions. Have you ever put a stamp on a letter? Have you ever used, yeah, somebody said, what? What's a letter? Have you ever talked with somebody on the phone and your phone was connected to a wall with a cord? How many of you think that vanilla ice is something you get at Starbucks? If that's you, that means you're a young person. I remember when my son Ben was graduating from high school, he said, Dad, I got a question. I got to fill out these college papers, and, and they asked me to make out a letter. He had no idea how to make a letter. I thought I'd failed him. But then I thought, well, why would he know? He didn't ever have to do that. He was young. The second thing we have in common with this young man is we are all, all of us are rich. Now, maybe we're not Elon Musk rich, but you do know that even the lowest socioeconomic group in western or middle Oklahoma, you know by the world standards, we're as wealthy as 99% of most of the world. So we are rich people. The third thing we all are is we're all powerful. And what I mean by that is you and I who live here today, we have opportunities for a flourishing future that the vast majority of the rest of the world does not have. You have opportunities, and that makes you a powerful person. And that's why I think that this story is so significant for us here today, because this young man represents something that most all of us are. And he's asking the very same questions that you and I ought to be asking. Here's the question we all want to know. How can I have a fulfilling life? Who doesn't want to have a blessed life? And so he asked the question, teacher, what good thing must I do to get this blessed life, to have life forever? Jesus said, if you want to have eternal life, you have to keep the commandments. The young man said, which ones? He said, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, honor your father and your mother, all of the big ones. And by the way, don't forget to love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said something that astounds me. I have kept all of those commandments. That's an amazing thing to say. I have kept all of those commandments. But what's so interesting to me is this young man, despite having kept all of those commandments, he believes deep in his heart that something is still missing because he actually asked the question, I've done all these things. What am I still lacking? I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm, I'm searching for a higher purpose. Jesus, can you give me one more thing to check off so I can finally find the satisfaction and the fulfillment that I'm really looking for? I want to be happy. And I, I love what Jesus does next. You know, this particular story is told in multiple gospel accounts. And if you go over to the gospel of Mark, this is Matthew we're reading from, but if you go to Mark, Mark says when he asked that question, it says, Jesus looked at him. I love it. He just, it just says he looked at him. And then it said, with loving eyes. He didn't assess him. He didn't say, I, I think you've got some potential, kid. He didn't look at his possibilities. He didn't look at what he had to offer. The Bible says that Jesus just looked at this young man with a, with a genuine look of love and respect, and he treats his question with seriousness. Jesus loved him. And then he brought the hammer down. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all of your possessions and give them to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Wow, Jesus. Man, I didn't see that one coming. Are you serious? I just wanted to be a good guy. I just wanted to be happy. But it's clear that you're not asking me for something. You're asking me for everything. I mean, what do you want, Jesus? My whole life or something? And the Bible says that the young man went away sad because he had many things. 
Jesus was asking him for too much. Jesus was inviting him to an unconditional surrender of his life to give everything to him. And the question is, is there nothing Jesus doesn't want? Now, sometimes, let's back up a second. Sometimes people hear this story and they think that this is a gospel story about money. They think this is a story about, well, maybe rich people can't really go to heaven or it's really hard for rich people to go to heaven or something. Let me tell you something. That's not what this story is about. I don't believe that at all. I think this is a real story about what it means to follow Jesus right now in this life with your whole heart. I think this is a story about the holy life. I think this is about what it means to love God with everything you have. Most people love God with most of what they have. I mean, most people would say 90%. That's pretty good. I love God with 90% of my life. But this is a story about loving God with your 100% heart, soul, strength, and mind right now. Now, I want to shift gears for just a second. I want to... I'm going to come back to this story in about five minutes or so, but I want, to, I, want, I want you to see a scripture that's from the Old Testament. This is a very famous scripture. This is one that you may have actually hanging maybe in your house or on your screensaver. This is a, this is, this is a really famous text. It's one of my life verses, but I want you to see it because I think it directly applies to what we're talking about before we come back to the rich young ruler. This is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord. What is trust? Trust is confidence. Trust is faith. Trust means you believe the other person has your best in mind, and so you do not question their motives. You believe something about them. That is trust. Trust in the Lord, how? With all your heart. Someone say all. Thank you to both of you. Do not depend on your own understanding. This is not a text to say you need to check your brain at the door when you become a Christian. God gave us an intellect. God gave us a mind. He wants you to use it. And, and so this isn't about not using your brain, but this is about accepting the fact that there are some things when it comes to the Christian life that you cannot figure out at the end of a pencil. There are some things that do not equate that you have to step out in faith and believe that there's something deeper and, and more mysterious but even more loving than you imagine. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't just depend on your own understanding, but look at this. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And and the word I want us to look at for just a second is is the word acknowledge. Because in your Bible translations, I'm going to guess that there's four or five different words, depending on what translation you have, that's actually used there. If if it's the NIV, it says acknowledge, but if you're in any other translation, it says something else. And it got me to thinking, why is the word different in different translations? And the reason is, is because it's a really, really hard word to translate. The Hebrew word is, is something that translators can't quite get their arms around. And so NIV says acknowledge, but other verses say different things. Because the Hebrew word is the word yada. And yada means to know someone in a deeply intimate and a deeply relational way. Yada. Not just to know about someone, but to, but to really deeply know them in a personal relational way. My daughter Megan's here, so on be, and in her honor, let me talk to you about Patrick Mahomes for a minute. Megan and I both like Patrick Mahomes. We're Kansas City Chiefs fans. I know a lot about Patrick Mahomes, okay? I know that he was a, his dad was a Major League Baseball player. I know that he was a three-star recruit for most of his high school, and, and so he had very few offers coming out of high school, but finally Texas Tech offered him, and he turned out to be a pretty good quarterback. He plays, in fact, there was one game against OU he threw for over 700 yards. I didn't love Patrick on that day, but, but he's a pretty good quarterback. He got drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs. Andy Reid, the head coach, thought so much about Patrick Mahomes that he actually jumped up like 15 uh, places into the draft to get him. Even though they had a quarterback, they believed he was special, and he was special. He ended up not only winning a Super Bowl in a second year, but he was the MVP of the league. 
it just goes on. He's one of the best quarterbacks in the game. He's a, he's a surefire Hall of Famer, and he has, a, he has an outstanding sneaker collection. So I know a lot about Patrick Mahomes. But I don't know Patrick. You know what I'm saying? You can know a lot of facts about something or someone, but it doesn't mean you yada Patrick Mahomes. I don't yada him. In fact, yada is such an intimate word that that's the word in the Old Testament that's used for the description of a husband and wife in a physical, intimate relationship. Adam, yada, Eve, and Cain was born. That's the word that's actually used for that. And so, Think about what this passage is saying. Let's pull it up one more time. This passage is saying, if you really want to know God's ways, if you really want to know God's will, you, in all your ways, yada God. This is a call for us not just to know stuff about God. Listen, there's so many people in this room who could tell you a lot of things about God, but it doesn't mean they know God. It doesn't mean they know God in an intimate and personal way where, where everything you have is given over to Him. And that's what this whole passage is about. When you know more about God than your head knowledge and your intellect, but when you know God in a deeply personal and intimate way, when everything you have is given over to Him, that's when you begin to know the heart of God, and that's when He will direct your path. So we're not looking here to have God's will just dropped out of the sky like some kind of a treasure hunt. But when you deeply begin to know the heart of God and he, he owns you 100%, that's when you have the assurance He will show you what to do. In all your ways, know God. Now let's come back to this young ruler. We know he was a good person. We know he was a moral person. But Jesus said something to him that just completely knocked him off his feet. He said, there's just one thing that you're lacking. If you want to be perfect, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And all of us, if we're honest, say, Jesus, that's asking a lot. I mean, perfect? Because when we think about the word perfect, we think about flawless. We think about without error. When we think about being perfect, we think somebody who never makes a mistake, and, and we want to say, Jesus, is that what you're asking of me? You want me to be a person who never makes a mistake? We know that you don't, but, but we're not that way, Jesus. But here's the problem. That's not what the word perfect means in the New Testament. The word perfect means complete. The word means Whole, W-H-O-L-E. The word means that every part of your life is working in exact synchronization with, with the heart of God so that your heart beats like God's beats, that, so that your heart begins to look like Jesus. And you want to know what holiness is? That's what holiness is. The ultimate question of the holy life, is everything so surrendered to him? Is everything so under his control, including the things that you love the most, that's the definition of holiness. One of, one of my mentors says it this way. It means there's not a corner of your life that's cut off from the control of Jesus Christ. It means a completely surrendered life so that 99% won't quite do if you want to really know God intimately and if you want to be completely aligned with his purpose in your life, it's 100%. So this rich young ruler was asking, Jesus, give me one more thing to do because I know in my heart I'm not fulfilled. I'm not where I want to be. And Jesus keeps trying to tell him, I don't want one more thing from you. There's not one more commandment I want you to obey. I want you completely, wholeheartedly. I don't want your stuff. I want you. Now, it's fascinating to me when you look at this passage, do you know as far as I can tell there's not one other time in all of the scriptures where Jesus actually tells somebody to go and sell everything they have and give it to the poor. If you can find it, come see me after service. I'd like to see it. I don't think there's another passage that says that. And all of us who live in middle-class America kind of say, whew, that was a close one. So why did Jesus say it to this young man? Why did he say it in this instance? 
Because Jesus knew that the heart of this young man was to obey him in every other category of, of life except for his money. That was the one, that was the one percent he was holding back from Jesus. And Jesus was trying to say, I, I want there's not to be a corner of your life that's not surrendered over to me. And because I love you so much, I want complete intimacy with you. I don't want your 99. I want your 100%. I want you completely wholly given over to me. That's why he asked him that. If you're here today and you're thinking that Jesus' control over your life is just about him being boss, you've missed one of the deepest secrets of the New Testament that Jesus actually wants to know you deeply and intimately. And when you give yourself wholly over to him in complete and unqualified surrender, you get all of Jesus in return. That's the definition of a holy life. I want to say to every young person here, if you're thinking about what are you going to do for the rest of your life, let me give you the best advice I could give you this morning of anything. Your best career advice be 100% in with Jesus. Your career will take care of itself. Your life will take care of itself. Don't be unqualified, uh, without qualifications, surrender to Jesus. That's the best advice I can give you. Jesus doesn't want part of you. He wants the whole package. I'm going to tell you one more story, and then I'm going to be done. One of my favorite holiness preachers, and you know this because I talk about him all the time, but is Dennis, Dennis Kinlaw. Dennis died a few years ago. He's in his 90s. One of the most amazing holiness preachers I've ever heard. I, I still talk to Dennis every day. I read, his, I read his devotional along with Oswald Chambers. Those are my two dead mentors that continue to talk to me. I first heard Dennis Kinlaw preach when I was in seminary. I was in my early 20s, kind of like this, this young man. And I was sitting at about the fourth row of that seminary chapel, and Dennis Kinlaw started talking about holiness. And he talked about holiness... It was the first time I ever heard holiness talked about God's control over my life as a means to intimacy. Up until that time, I'd always assumed that God wanted all of me because God was the king and God just wanted to be in charge. And I was kind of okay with that, but it didn't quite feel right. But Kinlaw helped me understand that day that God wanted unqualified surrender, not because he's bossy, because he's loving, because he wants all of me. He wants a deep, he wants to yada me, and he wants me to yada him. And then Dennis Kinlaw told this story. He said it was 1964, and he was teaching at a seminary called Asbury Seminary, a very fine seminary in Kentucky. And a young kid came to the seminary whose name was Bruce. Bruce was about 29 years old at the time, and he, he was living in Colombia and Venezuela. And Dennis was intrigued by his testimony and how he had come to the school. And so he said, hey, why don't you come to my, my house tonight, Bruce, and have dinner with my wife and I, and I want to hear your whole story. And that night, Bruce told him that he'd been a banker's son, he'd grown up a Lutheran, but when he was 15 years old, someone gave him a New Testament. And he was prompted to read the New Testament. He read it all the way through. Bruce read that. And after he finished reading it all the way through, he started reading it again at 15 years of age. And halfway through that reading, Bruce gave his heart to Christ. And when he gave his heart to Christ, Bruce just made a decision. He said, I, I, if, if Jesus loves the whole world, I want to love the whole world that Jesus loves too. So he went down to the bookstore and he bought a world atlas. Now, if you don't know what a world atlas is, it's further confirmation that you're a young man or a young woman. A World Atlas is a big magazine-like book where you, every single page has one country of the world and all the details about that country are there. And, and you can go through page by page and see every country of the world. And Bruce decided, at 15 years of age, I'm going to pray through that atlas, two countries a day, and I'm going to pray over those countries. And as he kept praying through that atlas every single day, there were two pages that kept capturing his imagination. And that was the pages for Colombia and Venezuela. So he started to do some research about Colombia and Venezuela, and he found out that there were primitive Indian tribes there who had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he began to have a heart for those countries until halfway through his university studies, when he went to college, Bruce made a decision. He sold everything he had, which wasn't much, and he bought a one-way ticket to Caracas, Venezuela, 
He had $72 in his pocket when he arrived in Caracas, Venezuela, and that's where he was going to serve. As he was going through customs, the customs agent asked him, how long do you want to stay in Venezuela? Bruce said, permanently. They said, well, who's going to take care of you while you're here? Who's going to handle your finances for you? Bruce said, God is. They said, could you give us God's Venezuelan address, please? Bruce said, I haven't been here long enough. The customs man said, well, look, I think you're a fine young man, but that's not enough for you to stay in Venezuela. We're going to have to ship you back to the United States. And Bruce was just crushed. He went back to a little room. They held him there for a few hours. They came and they said, hey, your plane leaves in an hour. Why don't you go get a sandwich in the restaurant? So Bruce is sitting there by himself eating his sandwich when all of a sudden a very distinguished Latino gentleman came over in a very nice suit and asked in perfect English, can I sit with you? Bruce said, of course you can. He sat down. The man said, you're a gringo, aren't you? Bruce said, I am. He said, can I ask you, what are you doing all the way up here? And Bruce said, you know, I've, I've discovered these primitive tribes that live in this country, and my heart is drawn to them. I want to give my life to serving and helping those tribes. And that Latino man said, you know, that's a very noble thing for you to do. Can I help you with that? Bruce said, well, who are you? The man said, I'm the personal assistant of the president of Venezuela. And that very day, the president of the country signed the papers for Bruce to stay as long as he wanted to stay in Venezuela. Now, I don't have the time to tell you the rest of this an amazing story because over the course of his ministry of 50 years, Bruce became a world changer. There have been books written about Bruce's ministry in those two countries. But finally, at the end of that conversation, sitting at that dinner table, Ken Law pushed back from the table. He crossed his arms like this. He looked at Bruce. He shook his head. He said, Bruce, i got to ask you something. You were 19 years old. You didn't have any edu you, you hadn't finished your education. You had no support base. You had nobody resourcing you. Bruce, i got to ask you, why couldn't you wait? And Ken Law said that he turned away as if he had a secret. He wasn't sure if he should tell him or not. But then he looked back at Ken Law. He looked him right in the eyes, and he said these words. I had found an intimacy with Jesus that I was afraid I would lose if I didn't obey him completely. And at that very moment that Ken Law told that story, he looked directly at where I was sitting, four rows back in that chapel. He looked me right in the eyes and he said these words, do you want to know what I think is missing more than anything else in the American church today? Intimacy with Jesus. We have all the knowledge. We have all the Bibles. We can go to Mardell and get books. We have the intellect, but we don't have the yada. We know about God. But Kinlaw said, we don't really know God. Not the kind of intimacy that God wants to have where, where it's not 90% in, it's not 95% in, but it's 100% everything's yours, God so that I can have everything of you. And that morning in that chapel, God did something in my heart that changed me forever. I was saved. I was at seminary. I was studying for the ministry. I was in a relationship with God, but I knew in my heart that day that I didn't have the intimacy with Jesus that I wanted and desired. There was part of me that was still missing. And that morning, I came down as a young preacher, and I knelt at that altar, and I said, God, I'm all in. It's not 99%. It's everything. I'm giving you 100% because I want 100% of you. And I want to tell you something. I've been... My life has been full of mistakes. I've made a lot of bad decisions. I was your pastor. You know I made bad decisions. But let me tell you, I've never regretted the moment of a full consecration of my life to Jesus. He has never disappointed me. 
That's what the definition of holiness is. It's an unqualified, fully surrendered self to say there's not a corner of my life that's cut off from the complete control of you, Jesus. If you want to know full satisfaction, if you want to know fulfillment, would you let Jesus look at you? Let him look at your face right now. Imagine it. Look at his love. Look at his passion for you. Look at the way he's not evaluating you, but he just draws you to himself. Can you hear him say these words? I want all of you. I want it all. Not because I want to control your life, but because I want an intimacy with you where your heart is fully aligned with mine. And if you'll give me everything of who you are, you have the promise of having everything of who I am. You know how often I have to keep going back and praying, Lord, here's, I'm giving it back again. About once every day. Had a situation in our family this week. My 1% I keep holding back is probably my family. Had a situation over the last couple of weeks in our family that my heart got nervous and scared and I could feel myself pulling back and I had to just keep saying, Lord, it's, it's all yours. My family's yours. You're going to have to keep giving your 1% back. But your relationship with Jesus is going to go deeper and deeper and deeper. I'm going to ask you to stand, would you? Is your heart hungry for all of Jesus? I'm not asking if you're in a relationship with him. I'm sure you know him. But how deeply do you want to know him? Let me tell you, the price to pay for that is a holy life. It's a life where you're 100% in. We hadn't planned to do this in the first service, but God met us in the first service, and Pastor Rick came up, and he, he, he just opened the altars, and God moved on the first service. And we're going to do that again. It's not because we're trying to count who comes and prays. That's not what that's about. But this is about an invitation to you of saying, God, here's my 100%. That's the heart of holiness. So if you want to come and pray, I'm going to pray a prayer. We're not going to prolong this. The worship team's going to sing a song. It's a beautiful song of invitation. But if you just want to come and kneel and just say, God, I, I don't even know what my 100% is, but I, I'm giving it to you. It's yours. I want everything in your hands. I want to know you. So come and pray if you want to pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your look of love upon all of us here today. And I thank you that you want us. You don't want our stuff. You want us. We're amazed that you want us. But Lord, if you love us that much, we want to love you that much. And so we just push it all to the front of the table. We're all in. 100%, nothing held back, unconditional surrender. May it be so today.
God is so faithful to meet us and to speak to us. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Busick, for God's word this morning. As you go from this place, will you go um, in the love of God, in the grace of Jesus, and in the power of the Holy Spirit? God bless you. You're dismissed. We are so glad that you joined us this morning.